New technology is changing our lives. It is disrupting the power structures, bringing down once powerful businesses and industries. It is liberating us, it is empowering us. But digital technology is disrupting institutions that have served us and protected us. Increasingly, it is being used to control us. The world is witnessing unsettling changes that are leading us rapidly in directions we may not want to go. One of the world's most important observers and analysts of this process is right here in Vancouver at the UBC School of Journalism. Please welcome Taylor Owen. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, I want to talk tonight a bit about fake news and why I think it matters for democracy. In 2008, Obama was the first social media candidate. At the time, Facebook had um, 100 million users and was only four years old. Zuckerberg was just slightly older than that in that picture. <laughs> in 2012, this photo, the day after the election of the Obamas, became the most shared photo in history. Facebook had grown to a billion users, and it's pretty safe to say that the Obama administration and Silicon Valley had a pretty cozy relationship. So it's surprising that in 2016, Obama used his final spe speech as president to deliver a stark warning to the American people. Americans, he argued, had become isolated from one another by competing facts. And Facebook had built what he called a dust cloud of nonsense. If Eisenhower had used his final speech as president to warn of the military-industrial complex, Obama's message was more dire. Democracy itself was at risk. How did Obama go from the social media cheerleader to warning that Silicon Valley was killing democracy? The answer, I think, lies in the idea of fake news. Since the, since the election, um, Trump has begun using fake news as a clumsy, Stalin-esque attack on the free press. But for a moment, it actually meant something quite specific. This moment began in, two, in May 2016, when this story about Megyn Kelly went viral. The story was viewed by, hundred, by hundreds of thousands of people, was politically polarizing, and was entirely fake. And it was enabled by a series of design changes that Facebook made to their platform. They added a share button to allow content to go viral. They, embed, they allowed ads to be embedded directly into the newsfeed, blurring the line between paid and organic content. They created tools that, allowed, that made um, everything look like legitimate journalism. And perhaps most significantly, in response to a big political controversy about their trending section being politically biased, they fired all the humans and replaced them with algorithms. 48 hours later, this trending section was subsumed with fake information, including the Megyn Kelly story, the first big fake news story of the election. The, this was only the beginning, of course. As, uh, as a BuzzFeed reporter, Craig Silver, Silverman, described, the next three months would see a rise in what he called fake news, misinformation made to look like legit, legitimate journalism. Since the election, uh, governments have slowly begun to pay attention to this problem, and Silicon Valley companies have started to roll out a series of solutions. But I want to propose that this debate we're having now in the public and many of these solutions risk conflating the symptom of this problem with its core causes. And I think the core cause is the actual design of our digital infrastructure itself. The internet, as most people consume it right now, is controlled by four platform companies worth a combined $2.7 trillion. These companies increasingly mitigate core aspects of our lives. And they do so governed by two key attributes, which are actually what I think Obama was warning us about. First, fake news is a product of the way our attention is surveyed and monetized. Data brokers, build detailed profiles of each of their, our lives, our, our, their users and our lives, and sell them as commodities. Using these profiles, they sell ads against us, inferring our moods, our desires, and our fears. Facebook has told advertisers that it can tell when a teenager feels insecure, worthless, and in need of a confidence boost. As Zainab Tufekci recently observed, think Huxley, not Orwell. 
21st century surveillance and manipulation is new, individualized, and plays on our social needs. And it's immensely profitable. Facebook made $40 billion last year, almost entirely off of advertising. But surveillance capitalism also rewards lowest common denominator content, enables a race to the bottom for more and more surveillance, and creates a free market for our attention. Second, our digital infrastructure is increasingly determined by artificial intelligence. AI and the algorithms that power it um, are what determine what we see on platforms and whether we are seen. Um, but they also are largely unknowable, even to those that created them, or at their core, commercially driven, and are laden with the biases and subjectivities of their data and their creators. It was an algorithm that suggested Jew hater and how to burn Jews as an ad targeting recommendation in Facebook. It was an algorithm that repurposed a brutal, hateful comment under a woman's Instagram post as an ad for user engagement. And it is algorithms that widely distribute perverted versions of children's cartoons inside YouTube Kids. And I would suggest this problem is about to get way worse. This is a demonstration of software called Face to Face, which is allowing the man on the left to make the man on the right say anything. This kind of tool will be used soon to deliver customized versions of news and events into our personal social feeds, millions of simultaneous versions of reality. Returning to the 2016 election, I think it's these two attributes, surveillance capitalism and the rise of AI, that actually allowed Russia to target millions of Americans with messages intended to foment dissent in the lead up to the election. And they did so using the tools that were provided to anybody on these platforms. As Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook said in response to the anti-Semitic ad controversy, we never intended or anticipated this functionality being used this way, and that is on us. Yes, it is. But I would suggest it's actually a bigger problem. It's a bigger problem for our democracy. When common perceptions of reality become ungrounded, when we no longer know what we know or how we came to know it, and when there's no common version of events, however imperfectly constructed, how does society mitigate collective goods? Shared experience is at the core of democracy, and this is really slipping away. So Facebook didn't fail when it um, used AI to match foreign agitators with micro-targeted US audiences, or offered how to burn Jews as an ad purchasing group, it was actually working as it was designed. And it's this definition of working and this design that presents a threat to our democracy, I think needs to be held accountable, and for which governance oversight is urgently needed. Thank you so much.